Oh, this is Dr. Martin uh, just recording uh, a uh, lecture for um, Monday the 16th of um, November. So just looking at the syllabus here, it's pretty amazing. So so tomorrow's the 16th. This week we have 16, 18, 20. Well, I, I may not do a class on the 20th. We'll see. I'm, I'm, well, I don't know. Anyway, uh, and then uh, we'll have the 23rd and the 25th next week. And then we'll have the second, or no, sorry, the thirtieth and the second. Now that, that's it. So we only have one, two, three, four, five more classes, or four more after today. And I may skip Friday because uh, it was really. Uh, so I'll, I'll do. I'll I'll start reviewing. I'll, I'll probably start reviewing on Wednesday. I don't know. We'll see. So I, I'm going to cover eleven uh, B uh, today, um, and. But this is kind of extra material. Um, anyway, so I'll cover 11b. All right, so a uh, couple things. Uh, so the last day to make up labs will be Wednesday uh, next week. So next week you'll still have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but that's it. After the 25th, uh, the TA won't come to the lab anymore. There will be no more labs, and uh, you will not be able to make up or turn in any more videos. So get your videos in for your labs. I know there are quite a few people who are missing labs. If you're missing two labs, my current plan uh, is to give you an incomplete and have you make it up within a year. But you will get an incomplete for this semester. You'll have to make it up sometime starting in January. Um, so, and not, not, not next week or the week after or the week during finals. Uh, we're not making up any labs. The, this year, last day to make up labs is going to be the 25th, and that's it. So if you're missing two or three labs, get them done, take the video, and send it to Alex so you can get credit. So you got to get that done. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's dig in. So we're going to talk about the stages, uh, well, the, the advantages of language-based designs, and then the stages of designs. So we'll go through this. Uh, I, I'm not planning on specifically asking you details of this uh, on a test. I won't promise not to ask you a little bit about it, but but I'm not going to ask you, I'm not going to pimp you about memorizing this whole list or anything like that. But I, I want you to sort of have just kind of an I, a little bit of an idea. But concepts, I do want you to understand. Like, I want you to be able to have a handful of reasons, uh, sort of what the advantages of language-based designs are. So if I ask you to, to, to pick two or three out of a list of statements, that you'd be able to do that. Um, and then if I talked about, you know, kind of the general flow, uh, to name a few of the steps, you wouldn't have to name them all, but maybe two or three steps, that'd be great. Uh, there are quite a few steps, obviously. Uh, the synthesis, the the timing verification, uh, place and route, rule check and extraction, design entry, uh, you know, the specification, partition the design into different uh, blocks, basically, uh, functional simulation and verification, and some of these things. Um, but again, you know, I don't, I don't want you to memorize them. Um, just want you to kind of, you know, uh, kind of understand the concepts, really. That's it. All right. So, what are the, some of the what are the some of the advantages of language-based designs? So, and I've I've said this before, but it's important to re reinforce it that the the idea that somebody could sit down and design, you know, a core i7 Intel chip, you know, with five cores, uh, you, that you just that's just not possible. For starters, this is only something that's been developed after, you know, a whole bunch of generations before, and and just process improvement on these generations and and they're just you know they're making incremental improvement now that's not to say that occasionally there there aren't some real breakthrough things there have been uh, you know they develop pipelining they advance branch prediction they develop cache they they developed a lot of things um, and and of course I, I've said some of these things before but they bear repeating the, the between uh, in the old days, when I when I was doing my PhD thesis and I was uh, using a 6502 chip to uh, 
uh, the same one that was in the, the original Apple II. Uh, and I was using that and developed, uh, uh, put 2K memory on a special card and, and, uh, and had it so that the, uh, the host machine and the on card uh, 6502 could both access the memory simultaneously. And uh, that way they could communicate uh, very quickly. Uh, I uh, the memory the 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 processor did not have to wait on the memory at all. Now, uh, but I, I of course I was you know I was using static memory. Uh, I think the Apple II might have used. Uh, I think it, I don't know if you used static memory or not, uh, but. The very first IBMs did use dynamic memory, and, and the Apple II might have, I don't remember. But it only had 64K, so that was, that was it, it might have just been all static. But in any event, uh, when, we, when we transitioned to, uh, to dynamic RAM, because of the overhead of having to refresh it and all that, it, it's, a bit, it's a little bit complicated. That, that, that required a dedicated motherboard. And in those days, the... Uh, the dynamic RAM and the processors were about the same speed. So uh, a, a fetch from uh, your, your memory, your dynamic RAM, was basically about the same amount of time that it took to, uh, to execute an instruction. So, so, so the memory didn't really slow the processor down at all, really. Then the processors got faster and faster and faster. And uh, not so much, I guess, the embedded design, uh, you know, the, the micro uh, controllers, but but the big Intel chips and AMD chips, they got faster and faster and faster, to the point where where the processors cranking through stuff at you know like a thousand times or maybe ten thousand times the speed of a single memory fetch. So so you lose a lot of instruction cycles when you have to go out to dynamic RAM, and and then the disk drive even slower even if it's a even if it's a solid state uh, drive the same thing it's just a lot slower than uh, than the random access memory and and it slows it down even further so so the fact that these things um, really did take a lot of time uh, uh, to get memory in this forced the development of on-chip cache now the on-chip cache is uh, is very very fast and it's really just registers uh, built, you know, in, integrated on the same circuit, same piece of silicon as uh, as the CPU and all the, you know, uh, the CPU and the math coprocessor and all this. So, so as computers have changed, uh, you know, that's definitely uh, that's yes, as the speed of one component's greatly outstripped the speed of other components, that it, that really has changed the state of the art quite a bit. And these very complicated chips, with uh, you know, with with onboard cache and branch prediction and and all this multi-stage pipelining, these things, these, these complicate and you know, multiple cores and it just goes on and on. These things just simply, there's no way you could sit down with a piece of paper and draw a schematic. It's impossible. For starters, uh, I think the latest uh, uh, the latest uh, latest uh, chip let's see the uh, the latest graphics card from Nvidia uh, has an eight nanometer um, feature size uh, chip and and it has I believe they said uh, I, I think I can't remember if it was a two billion or four billion transistors on this chip can you imagine uh, the, it's hard to even communicate uh, if you just had uh, uh, four billion pennies, for instance, uh, that's that's I don't know. It would probably take several semis to hold them. And the weight would be uh, the weight would be such that the semis couldn't couldn't be filled up to the brim, and without you know breaking their axles. I can't even imagine. Uh, it's I don't know. We should do the math. So. So let's see. So four billion pennies. So that would be uh, that would be four hundred million four hundred million uh, dimes. That would be uh, forty million dollars. 
So imagine forty million of forty million dollars in pennies. That's a lot of pennies. And can you imagine if each one of those pennies represented a transistor with uh, several connections that have to be made to it? That's that's a that's almost an uncountable number of connections. Maybe maybe something like twenty billion connections. These these are these numbers are just so 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 huge. Nobody can deal with this. You you have to have computer based tools to, to even begin to have a chance. And then in addition to that, you have to you have to break your project down into into parts so that these parts can be uh, created independently and debugged and uh, and worked on completely independently of the other parts before you try and even begin to put them together. Um, so the only way this is possible is with language-based uh, tools. Uh, this uh, a schematic, a schematic big enough to uh, so if you do the math, let's say let's say you had a schematic, and to draw one of the transistors took took a square inch with its connections and all that one square inch and you let's say you drew four billion of them how big would your schematic have to be to have four billion square inches and that doesn't include of course power connections and a whole bunch of other things but let's say you're just going to look at at the four billion transistors and you're going to put each one in one inch of paper how big would your pa your sheet of paper have to be to hold four billion well it turns out it has to be one square mile one mile on each side long now where are you going to roll this paper out where, where are you going to have a nice flat field a square mile by a square mile or a mile by a mile and you're going to be able to lay it out and then you're going to be able to walk on it and not destroy and tear it up and since you know walking miles and miles every day to check the schematic you probably have to fly in a little helicopter. I mean, you can see this is just ludicrous. It's not possible to do this without computer-based tools. It's not possible. It's not. It's not even comprehensible. So. So that's why, we need these language-based tools, kind of in a nutshell. Um, and then another problem is, of course, you're you're you you don't have all day. Uh, so. I don't know if you know, but uh, but AMD and Intel are in uh, they're in a they're they've been of course the two main uh, competitors for um, you know for the chips that drive desktops lap mo desktops and most of the laptops and these uh, AMD has gotten an advantage on Intel because Intel uh, struggled getting their ten or eight nanometer technology to work. Uh, their foundry was having troubles with uh, with uh, producing chips and at high uh, uh, at at, uh, at at high uh, uh, productivity rates. They're, they 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 run a uh, um, you know a, a a wafer through the process and and maybe they wouldn't get the yields that they needed. Um, you know there'd be a bunch of bad chips on it and. So AMD all of a sudden has uh, has really been getting market share, and now AMD uh, just announced that they're going to uh, acquire Xilinx, and Xilinx is I th I think Xilinx is a forty billion dollar company. Um, so this is just really crazy. So they're going to have an eighty billion dollar or more. I don't know. I I'm not, not sure how big AMD is. Uh, so this is this is just huge, and. Uh, and they're what they're trying to do is they're trying to drive the wooden stake through the heart of Intel, and uh, and really uh, and really cripple them. Um, so this time to market thing is really big, and uh, if you screw around with your design a little too long, uh, y you may take an entire uh, mega company like Intel and just really cause some major problems. Now in this case, it wasn't it wasn't their um, you know, well, 
it wasn't their language-based design tools, I guess, although I don't know, but uh, it looked like it was more of a foundry problem. Uh, the other thing is these language-based designs uh, are reusable. Uh, you can you can uh, you can do a design, say, of a math coprocessor, and once you complete it, uh, you may never have to go back and visit it again. You may just be able to use it over and over again in all your subsequent designs. And having proven the technology works, you you may be very confident in it. Uh, So that can be a huge advantage when you're concerned about getting to market very quickly. And in and, and today's uh, competitive marketplace, time to market's a big deal. Uh, you often need to integrate existing intellectual property from multiple sources. You may buy, uh, you know, like if you're making, maybe you're making a micro, you know, an, say a, uh, an embedded controller. You may need a, uh, a really good touch sensing module and you, you may just go out and buy that from a company that's doing it really well rather than try and, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel yourself. Uh, and then you might need um, maybe an array processor. Well, you just go buy that. And you, maybe you need a couple of other things. Maybe you need a, uh, an arbitrary uh, function generator. You'll buy that. And then maybe you need a, a good UART, so you'll buy that. And uh, when it's all said and done, uh, you, can, you can license uh, this intellectual property from a number of different sources, then you write the stuff to kind of put it all together. Then you maybe uh, then you license an ARM core, and boom! Now you have a really uh, very competitive, cutting edge chip that's maybe arguably better than a lot of other companies out there who uh, put the time in to actually make their own stuff. Um, and in order to do this, you've really got to have common design languages that 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 play together nicely. Verilog and VHDL are good examples of this. Uh, you can you can definitely integrate. You can have you can write your routine in Verilog. You can integrate VHDL IP, and everything works just fine. So uh, the other thing is uh, once you get once you get these existing IPs that are that that are presumably uh, tight and working well and don't have bugs in them, and you combine them, now you can simulate the whole system and make sure that in fact it does work together. Uh, this gives you huge advantages in time and uh, development cost savings. And this is only possible because you're using language-based tools with common, essentially common design languages. Uh, and then once you get this all done, you punch the button and the synth this synthesizer basically does the rest. Uh, this is huge. Uh, now, it's taken a lot of years to get these synthesizers smart enough, and I, I don't know you know, when they change to the next, uh, you know, say to, you know, from 28 nanometer to 10 nanometer or 12 nanometer to, to 10 to 8. I don't know, you know, what the synthesizers have to do, but obviously they're, they, they, they can do this. And uh, they, they may have to rewrite parts of them and fine tune them uh, to get them to actually uh, work correctly. But, but this is being done. We have successful eight nanometer chips uh, on the market. So the other really big thing is these language-based tools. Uh, they they give us a very um, they give us a, a very sort of uh, standard way of doing the designs, and it, it allows the the design engineer to really focus on what the circuit's supposed to do. Rather than getting getting really wrapped around the axle in these, you know, in at, down at the transistor level in little details, um, and you can do all the all the design steps on a single platform. The uh, if you try and do this, say in with analog languages like Spice, uh, once you get a design that's just super complicated, uh, Spice starts to fail because it can't it cannot comp it. There's a level of complexity that exceeds its ability, uh, but in these hardware description languages, uh, they're able to handle really, really big files uh, and put them together. And then the other thing is these languages continue to improve and and evolve to get uh, a little less difficult to learn, a little less complicated to use, a little little easier to uh, to uh, uh, get help uh, avoiding some of the mistakes. Uh, so we're definitely we're definitely making progress on making these 
uh, so you can work at higher and higher levels of abstraction. And one of the things that that allows uh, you to do is to try uh, a, a number of novel techniques that you would never have the, uh, the energy or the time to uh, take a look at. Now you can, now you, you know, if some, one of your young engineers gets a, you know, a crazy idea to try something, uh, you can say, okay, you know, fine, let's code that up and, and simulate it and see what it, see if that actually will work. Uh, and maybe it'll be dramatically faster and you, you could get a real breakthrough because you can try these novel things that you could otherwise would never, never have the time or patience to be able to, to go through a, a design, um, uh, you know, to, to go through a, a, the cycle of another design. Uh, but it, with these English language based tools, you can do that. You can work at a very high level and let the tool do all the heavy lifting. Okay, so let's talk about design flow. So first off, every design starts with a specification and uh, these are written and they describe the required functionality, the speed, the timing issues, how fast it has to deliver uh, results from inputs, uh, an estimate of the area that it's gonna take in, in, in silicon and uh, how much power is it gonna take and then uh, some sort of plan for testability. Is it going to do a power on self-test? Is it, is, it, is it going to, you know, are we going to do a visual inspection with uh, maybe a bed, a bed of needles? Or is it going to, you know, what are the various ways we're going to test this? And, uh, and then uh, uh, in our state machine charts, uh, we'll, we'll often uh, then have the, the, within the specification, we will include the SM chart describing the, the, the function of the state machine, uh, or there may be multiple state machines uh, in a big design. And uh, with your, with, you know, it may be that you can, that you can actually uh, start with your high level language description here, and that may be all you have to do. You may be almost finished at this point. So one of the things we typically do is partition designs uh, into functional units. And uh, you want to do this in a top-down manner so you, you have the big picture going in and then you can begin to parcel out what the sub what the sub modules might look like. And, uh, and you might even remember that you have done similar designs in the past and you can uh, reuse some of your IP or you may, you may have to purchase some IP. Um, and you may, there may be some, uh, some parts of the, uh, so, some, some, some of your divisions, your units, if you want to call them that, uh, that you have to work down to a, a deeper level of abstraction where you're actually maybe even getting into some of the real details of how you're going to implement it in, in what kind of gates and that sort of thing. But, but then other, other parts, maybe you don't, don't have to get into those details and you can leave it at a much higher level of abstraction and save a lot of time. And you can, you can also, uh, synthesize these these modules individually uh, you might you might not have a synthesizer that can even handle the the entire system but if you if you if you synthesize the modules individually then you may be able to put them together uh, in post synthesis um, so design entry so typically you this is where you compose your language based description of your design and we obviously use hardware description languages for this. And again, I mentioned this earlier, is this gives you time to explore some, some novel ideas about the architecture, about how the system might work. Um, it also, uh, when you do this with hardware description languages at a fairly high level, it, it allows the synthesizer to use all of its optimization ability. And that's one of the things that keeps happening. The synthesizers are just, uh, uh, getting smarter and smarter and have better and better optimizing abilities. Um, and then at this point, you're still really able to target uh, either programmable logic or a custom integrated circuit. These, har these English language based descriptions, these HDL designs, they're much easier to change. Uh, they're easier to debug and simulate and test. And once you have that hardware description functionality correct, then uh, 
then that can really serve as a as a real standard to make sure that as you as the, you flesh out the design and it turns into actual gate level hardware that you can you can go back and compare it to uh, to the HDL function and make sure it's it's performing the way it, the way that your higher level design uh, performed. So again, uh, rapid prototyping, uh, you can verify the functionality and you let the synthesis tools do the work for you. Um, so one of the things that, one of the steps that's critical is functional simulation and verification. So one of the things that you have to have in, in, right up front is your test plan. What features do have to be tested, how to test them, and how are you going to uh, define the correct outputs. Uh, you have to write the test bench. Uh, you're gonna, you can test each module individually, and then you can uh, put all the modules together and test them. Um, as your testing shows problems, then you go back and you improve, you correct the problems, improve your design, and then you uh, iterate that process again. And eventually, when you're done, you get functional verification. So you've proven that th that the hardware description language uh, of your of your system uh, is going to work the way you have specified it should. Then you take these individual modules that have been functionally verified, and now you integrate them into the entire design. Now you've got some additional testing and validation to do. You have to test this overall functionality. Uh, you have to have a new test bench to, to drive the overall system rather than an individual test bench for each of the, the, the major subsystems. You check those top level signals and you verify that all the buses that are connecting the modules are working correctly. And once you get that, you sign off all known functional errors at, that, are correct, that have been corrected and retested and then the design must demonstrate full functionality, and that's your pre-synthesis sign-off. So when you get the when you get to this point, it's signed off, and you're ready to synthesize. So the uh, so the nice part is this tool is done automatically, and uh, there are some trade-offs between design time cycle, chip area required, clock speeds, and when it's all said and done, it comes up with a net list. That's now. This is specific to whether you're going to implement it with an uh, with an, uh, an FPGA or, or whether you're going to build an integrated circuit from scratch. And and also, uh, no doubt uh, to some extent, then what technology is going to be used if you're making an integrated circuit. So then you have your post synthesis validation. Uh, now you compare the the synthesized gate level description to your original behavioral model, and you make sure that uh, a test bench can do this in a side-by-side -side manner by instantiating both models, drive them with common uh, stimuluses, and compare the outputs. And if there's any discrepancies, you need to understand what's going on and why they're there and whether they re represent a problem or not. And then you have uh, your timing verification. Now, you probably can't uh, nitpick every single pathway, but you definitely, but there will be critical pathways. Most commonly, your clock circuits are are an issue, and then you may have some high, some really high speed parts of the design that have to be looked at really careful. Uh, you have to do this step after placement and routing, since that can definitely uh, affect the uh, the timing, and uh, and your synthesis tools can't really predict that. Uh, the other thing is that when you put on the metallized interconnect pathways, it may add uh, it may add some parasitic uh, uh, capacitance uh, that may slow things down. And when it's all said and done, then you can actually measure uh, the time delays on on your FPGA. Uh, and there's some unpredictability how signals get routed through the big interconnect matrices. And if you have problems, then you're going to have to do repeat the synthesis until you get until you, you know, until you get what's called timing closure. So, the final chips then must be tested for false. Uh, so, 
these faults can be process related, uh, hopefully not design related. So yeah, dust in the clean rooms, defects on the uh, on the wafers, uh, and the original your original uh, test benches uh, may not be sensitive enough to pick up some of these problems. And when you're testing for sequential designs, obviously these these state machines uh, they present a real challenge because. Oftentimes, you really don't have any access to these in, to these internal states and uh, and the signals that are driving state changes and that sort of thing. Unless you build this in as a as a self test capability, you won't really know this. So, when you do the place and route, you can you can uh, uh, get some visibility into the clock traces. Um, it, you can uh, definitely insert a scan path at this point in the design. The other thing you can do, you can in include a debug core. And there's a lot of different debug cores you can include. But what you can actually do, uh, at least in an FPGA, uh, and you can do this in an ASIC too, you can, you can create uh, uh, on your FPGA uh, additional hardware that has as its only purpose uh, uh, testing and debugging. And that additional hardware can be uh, can be placed anywhere to uh, to uh, within your circuit, so that it can see uh, internal signals in modules and other things, and and then have these signals uh, brought out to a debug monitor. Uh, so this is this is very powerful. Uh, Vivado supports this for the Xilinx chips, and you can just include it. Now it does does take some resources. Uh, and if you know you don't have the extra resources to use, then you may not be able to do as much of this as you want. But and and uh, but you can definitely add this to the chip. Now it may it may add uh, some additional delays in the interconnect matrices, just because it has to be routed and placed as well, or placed and routed as well. Um, all right. Uh, so then you have the design rule check and does. What you what are what you have you have established a bunch of design rules, and now you're gonna you're gonna run your list of rules against the design and and see you know for instance uh, how wide uh, uh, various paths have to be, and you can check to see if uh, if in any of the uh, any of the uh, like if you're making an integrated circuit, you can make sure that all the widths uh, have. Are, are meet your design rules and that they have enough separation that there's not any uh, crossovers or shorts. Um, you make sure that you haven't uh, connected the output of a gate to too many inputs of other gates uh, so that you're violating fan out, uh, that you have traces that are, uh, that are running parallel to each other for a long time where there's some chance for uh, crossover crosstalk, uh, where you're sucking too much power, and uh, and and you're going to get uh, uh, power dips, um, and then you have to look at heat dissipation, and uh, and uh, RF noise. Um, there are a lot of RF issues. Uh, how you put, how you lay paths. If you have a sharp corner, that corner can become an antenna. So oftentimes you want a nice curved angle on the tracing, uh, and and there are all these uh, design rules that can be applied. This also comes into play uh, when you design a printed circuit board. You have uh, a design rule check for that as well, and with many of the same exact uh, issues. And then, uh, then you need to do what's called parasitic extraction. The uh, there's always parasitic capacitance, and um, there are software tools to uh, run through. Uh, these uh, paths and see where there's opportunities to uh, to decrease the parasitic uh, capacitance uh, by uh, rerouting traces, and then finally you're ch you're checking your timing constraints to make sure you still have timing closure, and finally there's final design sign off to commit to production, and uh, now you have your uh, your set of uh, photo masks and uh, all the steps in the foundry. It's all ready for fabrication. Uh, and uh, I'm not familiar with this, but there's this GDS2 format that, that lays out these, uh, uh, you know, how the chip's going to be produced. And here, 
here are the technology options. You have a, a fully custom IC uh, where you build it up from scratch. You have uh, an IC that's made up of standard cells, and then but you specify the custom mask. So you're, you kind of do the last layer and hook these standard cells together to get a, uh, uh, a custom IC, but it's not, it's not a fully custom IC. Or you can do a, a, an FPGA or, a, or like a CPLD or maybe some other programmable logic device. Um, the nice thing about your FPGA is that you can start your board design before your design is finished because you already know what your FPGA footprint is. So you can go ahead and lay the board out and you know where all the pins that are going to be used and you know how they're going to need to connect. So you can, you can have that part running and working uh, while the code's being written. Um, the other thing is you can, uh, you can update firmware in the field with FPGAs. Uh, so even, you know, you don't have to bring things back to the cycle, uh, back to the factory to reprogram them. You can uh, push out uh, firmware updates and have them uh, applied in the field. Some of this can even be done automatically. Uh, but with your FPGA, you always have to remember uh, your, your programmability costs you quite a bit of overhead. And it makes the chip bigger. It adds complexity. It spaces components out. Uh, and it's not nearly going to be as fast uh, as a custom IC would be. However, you're saving maybe half a million on the non-recurring engineering fee for the mass set and the custom IC. And you can also do low volume prototypes. Uh, and when you get those just humming along, working great, then, then, then if you want to scale up to really large scale production, then you could consider going with a custom IC. All right. Wait just a minute. Oh, sorry. Let me in. pause it here. Since you've okay, well, so um, so yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, all right. So what I would really like to say is, I I really want everybody to make sure you're 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 getting um, you're getting your work done. You've got all the your homework turned in. You you know you got the lab done oh i i haven't i haven't uh looked at the lab at the last test maybe i'll do that real quick while while everybody's here uh let's see i'm going to pull this over so you don't really need to see this but yeah so give me one second here actually i'll pause it and then i'll give you the Okay, so yeah, there were six students that didn't do the that didn't do test two. So I'll send out emails to you all, and you can tell you can let me know what's going on. Uh, the average for those uh, for the rest of the class was uh, eighty six. So pretty good result. That's a pretty good average. That's pretty high. So I think everybody did pretty well on the test. Um, so um, so. Just really finishing up your final project, turning in all your labs, final exam. That's all that's left for the course. So be sure and get the uh, get your uh, all your labs done first, and then start working on your final project, or make sure you're working on it. Uh, if you haven't sent me a, a little uh, uh, message indicating what you're going to work on, uh, I'd like to get that. Uh, and otherwise, we'll uh, I'll probably. I'll probably review. I don't know if I'll do any more lectures. Uh, there's just I, I've got a few more prepared, but um, so I may. I'll see if we have we do on time. But I do want to do some review and kind of talk about the final exam. The final exam is not going to be not going to be super bad. I you don't spend a lot of time studying for the final exam and slough off on your project and your your laboratories. Get your labs done. Get all of them turned in. And get your final project done. That's really more important, and that's where you learn the most too. So do that, and uh, uh, I'll do a little review for the final. It's it's going to be a pretty straightforward um, test. It's not going to be super difficult, and uh, uh, and so that'll do it. So don't worry about that. All right, I think that does it. Uh, we'll see you then um, uh, on Wednesday or our in lab this week. Um, we will be hanging around the lab so you can turn things in and get some help on your project if you need it.